Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Dangerous Jobs Podcast. I'm your host, Apollonia Rockwell, and we have part two with Mr. Gary Bonnet. Uh, I'm so excited to talk to you, Gary. This, Gary, everyone, if you haven't listened to our previous podcast, Gary is a safety professional over 20 years in this industry, over 20 years helping hundreds of thousands of companies around the world improve improving their safety programs, building their safety programs, either that be from scratch or companies that are uh, corporate corporations who've had established programs take companies even to the next level um, who are just trying to achieve greatness. Um, you've done it all, Gary. So how are you? I'm great. It's uh, it's great to be back on here with you. I know we had such a fun time last time and I, I just can't wait to do it again. Oh my gosh. Well, I have a million questions for you since last time. So we'll just get right into it. But um, one thing that we talked about offline is that we both don't like to work remotely in four, four walls confined. You mentioned that you love to be out and about chatting with your customers, um, engaged. And so what has that been? And I, and I was telling Gary offline, same with me. This is my first um, episode and week back from maternity leave. So I am zooming to the office. I'm like so excited to talk with people. It's been so great. And Gary, I can tell, I already know that about you, that um, you make an impact with the companies, the clients, the boots on the ground that you meet with. And so these last weeks, having that opportunity to really um, meet face-to-face -face with your customers recently, how has that been for you and what in the world are you seeing out there? Yeah, it's a it's a breath of fresh air and and really to to hear that from you also that just gives me some more validation of like I'm not the only one that's built that way um, because I am I am a people person I am not a work from home and seclusion type of individual like I've got to be around people where we can collaborate we can bounce ideas off of one another and we can really make some strides into what we're trying to achieve and so the past few weeks have been great of like oh. meeting with organizations just face to face getting into an office and really collaborating and making a difference so i love it um i'm just i'm beside myself right now so that's that's a little bit about me and and a little bit of an update but what i'm seeing is a couple different things um that that are really kind of sticking out right now with organizations that we're that we're dealing with um one is they are really starting to be very environmentally focused yeah. um whether that is um greenhouse gas uh emission uh or just overall just sustainability as an organization like organizations are really starting to embrace that. Yeah. The, the other aspect that we're seeing is, is really still more along the lines of that do more with less and frontline employee empowerment. Like our, our frontline employees are really sticking to their guns and saying, Hey, you know what? We, we really want to hear our voice, our voice to matter inside the organization. Yeah. We want, we're the subject matter experts out here doing it. Um, so here empower us, you know, make sure that we're trained, make sure that we're competent and then let us take the, the lead on this. And so those are the two big things that are really sticking out today. Wow. Well, it, I guess that is so amazing to hear that you're seeing that. And it also, what's going through my mind is that it echoes a lot of my last podcast before I went out on maternity leave, um, talking to a safety professional where he, his, uh, his whole mantra, his whole, um, life's missions work is the blue collar worker and understanding who that is. And so a lot of what you're saying really resonates because what he mentioned just from interviewing so many many just boots on the ground and mainly in in construction is that the biggest pain that he's seen out in the construction industry has been there hasn't been always a ladder or a clear path for let's say just your common everyday construction worker you know it's it's just been get the work done like get the work done and there's not really you know, maybe room for advancement or just you know that 
that organization that like a corporate company has that it says, oh, okay, you know, within this time frame, I'm going to be here. Then my next promotion is here. Then there, then there's these opportunities. So that just that roadmap hasn't been there for the average blue collar worker typically. And so when you're talking about empowerment and really showcasing that, hey, boots on the ground, they're the subject matter experts. Why don't we give them more training, more leadership training, more knowledge that they could take the reins and make more decisions themselves. So that's really interesting. And so um, talking more with these companies too, um, you've mentioned just kind of one thing that uh, before we got on the air, I was looking at some trends. And one of the big thing that's always flooding my mailbox is uh, like, what are the safety trends? And I've been seeing extended, tell me if you see any of this, extended work hours and fatigue, employee fatigue, and just more hyper focused on that issue. Is that something that you've seen this year or like a focus or an issue for your with your clients? Yeah, I would say over the the past year and a half, that's that's been a realization because um, there's been fewer people in in the workforce. Uh, yeah. So so that's a that's a gap. So they're trying to do more with less, and yeah. instead of trying to find uh, process efficiencies, it's it's been some organizations have just been throwing man hours at the problem, which isn't sustainable. Right, right. that is a short term fix. Um, that goes away overnight because of exactly what you said. It's that that burnout and that's not sustainable. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what I wrote down was extended work hours or it was like irregular work hours. I see that on the OSHA website a, a lot like this. These are highlights of things to focus on right now. And um, yeah, that goes a lot with what you're saying. People are trying to do more with less and probably companies have their their go to employees. Right. The ones that have been loyal, have been with them for X amount of years. And so they know they could trust these people. So let's give them all the work. <laughs> but that leads to this extreme burnout, which, as you know, leads to underlying issues like, um, I mean, when it comes to incidents, when it comes to things of that sort, having this fatigue, having this burnout is oftentimes, you know, obviously an underlying contributor to an incident, something like that happening. And so meeting with these companies, I'm sure, gosh, over the last 20 years, you've seen so much culture wise. And when you're, I mean, just shine light on these last couple of weeks, when you're meeting with these organizations, what is the feeling of the safety culture that you're getting today than maybe it was five years ago? And I hate using the word safety culture because I don't really believe in a safety culture. I just believe in organizational culture, like the Mm -hmm. company culture. But what does it look like today compared to what it was? Yeah, I think that organizations today are, are having that epiphany where it's we can't do things today or tomorrow the way that we have in the past. Um, It's just not going to work. It's not sustainable. Um, Whether it is exactly what you were talking about of, you know, riding our prize employee because we trust them, we can rely on them and, hey, look, we can burn them out. Um, they can't do that anymore. And, and that's where no matter whether it's their safety practices, uh, looking for efficiency, focusing on the environmental, you know, not giving their employees a po- uh, a, a voice mm-hmm. inside of their organization or even embracing technology. Like mm-hmm. those are, those are things that are like, Hey, we've got to do things different moving forward. So that's what, uh, the feeling that, that I'm getting from organizations is like, they're, they're they've seen the point of no return and they've got to make that jump. And some of them just have a an issue of like, I don't know how, because they've never seen what great is. They don't yeah. know what great looks like. So they need somebody inside of their organization or, or a part of their organization to come in and help explain to them, not just from a safety point of view, but from a business point of view, what does great look like and how do we get there? Oh my gosh. Okay. This just opens up a whole bunch, a whole bunch of questions. Then one, I was going to ask you, you've been seeing with these companies that the frontline worker is maybe being more empowered than they ever have been a couple of years ago or in the past. One, 
So, so many questions. One, what does that look like? How can you help? So you have, you have somebody listening right now that, okay, yeah, I get what you're saying, Gary. I do want to give, I'm a safety professional within an organization. I do want to help uh, the frontline worker. I want their voice, their voices to be heard. What are some ways to do that? I mean, be really practical. And it might be just be simple answers for you, but for a, a, a company just getting started, what are some steps that they could take to get there? Yeah, it's it's really uh, three pivotal steps at the beginning of this that are that are critical to get there. Number one is is really about trust and relationships. Is like you if if that's what you want to do, if you want to empower your front line, then you have to build that relationship with them. You have to build that trust so that they know that you have their best interest in mind. That's first and foremost. The yeah. second part is really about training is like not check the box training, not, hey, well, we kind of pencil whip this and we did it. No, but investing into their training holistically, not just what needs to be done, but what should be done as part of their training, whether that is compliance training, whether that is maintenance and reliability training, whether that's leadership training, whatever needs to get done. But then the third step is really giving them a mechanism right? And giving them a mechanism where their voice feeds back into the organization, G utilizing technology where, hey, whether they're doing a, an audit or inspection, creating a corrective action, uh, raising an issue, whatever it may be, but utilize technology so that this feeds back into their organization and, and it's transparent and there's some accountability to go along with it. And they know that it's not falling on deaf ears. Yeah. You know, I feel like if it were me and I'm filling out a piece of paper, like in yeah. today's world, if I'm filling out a piece of paper and I'm dropping that off at somebody's office or I'm dropping it off at corporate, yeah. like I just have this sense that no one is no one is reading that piece of paper. Where's that like, going? <laughs> yeah. Where did that go? And who has it? And what's gonna what's gonna happen to it? Because I just visually see it getting lost in another stack of papers. But I want to go back really quick. Mm -hmm. These three steps yeah. and not missing the first step no. is huge. You're talking about all right, how do we establish trust? Um, and a feedback loop within an organization. I love your three steps because if you if you miss the first one of relationships, I've been there and I've done that and I've missed the first step before. And when um, I've seen companies where they maybe pull the trigger and say, okay, maybe they're starting fresh. It's the beginning of the new year. All right, guys, like I, I really want to hear your, I really want to hear the voice. Um, you know, here's, near miss forms i want everybody to fill them out you're exactly right without step number one of creating relationships with your team there isn't trust to even write on a piece of paper or submit even if you have great technology if you just throw technology at a organization the team isn't going to trust what's what's going on here. What am I submitting if there isn't a relationship with the safety personnel or the supervisor, more importantly, um, with just the leadership team? So I think that's great. So for one, establishing relationships with your team is first and foremost. And then two, the, the either needed training or the should be training. I like how you said that. That's great. And then the mechanism, you know, just technology. I think that that's great. What are some technology, what are some systems that you recommend or that you've seen companies use if, you know, if somebody's listening and they want to look up some different ways? Yeah. So, uh, you know, having been uh, been a customer of of safety culture for the past, you know, nine years and an employee uh, during a stint in there as well. You know what? That's that's one system that has always worked well for me. Like it's yeah, yeah. super user friendly um, and it's easy to manipulate, but it's it has the accountability to go along with it of like you can't hide from from the data. So, yeah. so that's one one system that I've always recommended recommended because that's the one that I've always used to really empower, you know, my frontline. 
So whenever you look at those those three steps and and implementing the the technology, right? Just like you said, is is going back to step one yeah. is that you have to have that trust. You have to have that relationship. And we've all been inside of those organizations where maybe we missed it or we went into an organization where that trust and relationship hadn't been there in previous administrations. Yeah. So now you have to go in and, and reestablish that trust because we've seen it, whether it's near miss reporting or the utilization of stop work authority. They're like, well, I've done this in the past. Nothing ever got done about it. Or this guy got fired for doing this. Yeah. So we have to, to prove to them that, hey, this is a new day. This is a new way of the way that we're doing things inside of this organization. And once you have that trust built, then, hey, they're tra they're getting training. Then you implement the technology, so something like safety culture. And then voila, man, you're getting all of this value added feedback inside of your organization. And you're like, oh, my gosh, look at this gold. Look what we can do to make our organizations, our systems, our processes, our culture even better. Oh, my gosh. And you know what, too? I mean, I'm so happy you brought up these three steps because you know what? The first step going back again to this trust factor, this actually applies to ev the star of anything and everything in a safety program. You are completely right because, you know, now that I think about it, an HSE manual, any type of training, um, any program that you want to throw at your organization is not going to stick without step number one and really thinking about it out of everyone that I've ever interviewed safety professional wise doesn't matter the the industry doesn't matter the experience but when I'm asking what is the number one what is the number one thing a safety professional could start doing today to start taking that culture to the next level it has notoriously been start building relationships with your team because nothing else is going to matter after that so i don't think you have to wait for a new year to have a, a fresh new start you know we're in march almost april and it now is still a time where you can, if you feel, I like how you said that we've all been in organizations or have um, been in there ourselves, or we've worked alongside by companies where the trust isn't there and you can always feel it. Mm -hmm. You can always sense it, feel it. So if you are in that organization working with a company like that, now is not too late to start establishing that trust. I love that. Never what too else, late. Gary, what else, Gary, is on your mind working with these companies? You know, um, kind of what's, what's fascinating to me is this dangerous jobs um, philosophy that I think is oftentimes sugarcoated because, hey, we're safety professionals. Nothing's dangerous. It's all safe. It's all safe. It's all great. We got our programs. We got our training. but. In reality, people are engaged in dangerous activities, in dangerous jobs, in hazardous work activities every day. And nothing will, in my mind, sugarcoat that. Nothing will, um, I mean, I don't know what else, I don't know how else to put it, but that's just the innate, that's just the, the, the reality of it. So, what can we do as safety professionals? to help employees on that training aspect. How can we, how have you seen companies take their training to the next level? Yeah, and you make it a fantastic point on that is the, the environments that we work in, right? If they're uncontrolled, can be severely dangerous. I mean, yeah. catastrophically dangerous. And I was even uh, thinking about like over the course of my career, you know, working in the fire service, working uh, in your remote exploration uh, for, for mining, uh, working in oil and gas, working in chemical manufacturing, working in steel manufacturing. Like if those are uncontrolled environments, yeah. people get hurt severely and killed. And, and what we have to do as safety professionals is we, we can't keep a rose colored glass lens yeah. on our environment. 
we have to understand like what can happen. Yeah. Even if it hasn't happened in the past five, 10, 15, 20 years, we have to understand that like what can happen out there if these systems and processes, behaviors, you know, are uncontrolled inside of the organization. And that's where uh, I think complacency is something that we have to combat every single day, even in ourselves of, of saying, hey, you know what, this can happen and it can be catastrophic. So so those are some of the big things for me is the complacency and the realization of what is the risk and the hazard inside of your organization. Yeah. And I like how you said that of even if it hasn't happened in this last year, even if we haven't had a recordable in two years. And that is something so incredible to celebrate on the flip side. And simultaneously, I like how you worded that, is that we still have to talk about the reality of uncontrolled hazards in our workplace. What can happen? I feel like a lot of the safety training or materials that I've seen in th that's coming out this year, or last year, in these last couple of years, um, it's very surface level, um, very, how do I say it? Um, you know, very to the OSHA standards, very, yeah, I mean, just like very surface level. Like these are, these are the hazards, but it doesn't get into the severity, like you mentioned, of what could happen if these hazards are not controlled. And so since it's so out of sight, out of mind, then workers can go into a project blind if they're not understanding the reality of how dangerous their job could be. And I think that that's something that I would like to see more of um, on the training end this year. I mean, that's certainly what we focus on here at True Safety is, you know, is having be the best experience in the classroom training wise, hands on training, of course, but we want to paint a real picture. So that way employees can better protect themselves. That way they could take training more serious and their job more serious. Because, um, you know, I was still talking with families today, today, gosh, just, just this last week, I talked to a gal where her husband's best friend was just recently killed on the job as a, as a line worker. Hmm. And that trauma and that experience is just, it's just not talked about, but that's still happening today. So I think we still need to talk to talk about it. Um, so that way we can combat it, like you said, and not get complacent. Yeah. And I, I think that that's another thing that that we have to bring the realization to is is not only, you know, that that trauma to that individual of being hurt and or killed. But what is the ripple effect that comes out of that? How does that affect, you know, children, aunts, uncles, moms, dads, spouses, you know, what is that ripple effect and and really make that realization as well. And, you know, having been a, a part of uh, a couple of those incidents and seeing that firsthand, um, that that brought a whole different light to the the profession for me and really drives me to even to this day to to do what I do. Oh, my gosh. And I, I you can always tell when you're talking to another safety professional or heck, even owner of a company or a supervisor. You know, it's so interesting. I never thought about it this way. Um, you can always tell the difference when you're talking talking to somebody who's experienced um, trauma, right? Who's experienced catastrophic events in the workplace yep. because they're driven differently. The way they lead is different. The way that their whole mindset, obviously, their life will never be the same prior to that experience. And just like you, I've worked on those catastrophic cases and it's changed the way I think about safety. And so maybe that's where I'm coming from with rebranding and retitling the podcast, the Dangerous Jobs podcast, because I've I've seen it and we've lived it. 
And um, I'm dedicated just as you are. I know you're just as passionate to serving the frontline worker who's putting their life out on the line every single day, whether we want to acknowledge that or not, that's the reality um, with a lot of these occupations. And um, I know you're doing everything possible to bring workers home safely. So I just want to acknowledge you for that. I know you're doing a lot um, to serve that community. So any final thoughts, anything that you're really excited about um, these next couple months, anything on your mind with safety? Well, we've got a, a lot of big projects on the, on the front burner uh, across the U.S. in the in the next couple months. So super excited with that, and to to get into organizations where where we can make that change, where we can uh, bring a second or third set of eyes to look at their systems, look at their process, you know, evaluate their culture, and and give them some recommendations of how they can do things better, how they can be more efficient, more effective, have better quality inside their organization. Organizations. So that's probably what I'm the the most excited uh, for. Plus, baseball season just kicked off. So super excited for that as well. Awesome. That's exciting. That is exciting. Oh, my gosh. Well, I still I mean, every time we talk, I'm always thinking about where the conversation can lead to next time. And, you know, your perspective is so valuable to me and the audience because you're serving you know, not just one industry, you know, you work with all industries, um, large, medium sized corporate international companies, um, international problems is what that really means to me. And so to get your perspective here at the at the end of the year, you know, here in a couple months, time goes by so fast, but, you know, just to kind of follow up and see what are some of the lessons learned, what are some of the, some of the things that you've seen this year would be really, really uh, interesting. So I'd love to talk to you again. I'll be back anytime. Awesome. Thank you everyone for listening. And again, guys, we will uh, link Gary's um, contact information, his LinkedIn. If you have any questions, um, when Gary's talking about how to make an organization great, what he's seen companies do that went from ordinary and they want to get to that extraordinary level. Um, if you have any questions like that, feel free to reach out to, to Gary on his LinkedIn. I'm sure you wouldn't mind it, but we'll we'll link all that for you. But thank you for listening and thank you for being here today, Gary. Thank you.